looking at our good friend Job, and we're talking about Job, looking at Job chapter 6. And uh, I see Taylor is joined. Glad to have her there. All right. So now, um, in our study uh, with Job, we then already came through the uh, opening portions, which I'm not going to do a lot of review on, just to kind of mention. We know in chapter 1 and 2, we see the dialogue that's going on behind the scenes, that spiritual realm that happened between Satan and God and their discussion about Job, which allowed this whole situation to be before us. A couple of things that we need to keep in mind. Job and his friends don't have the advantage of knowing that story. And then we saw in chapters 1 and 2 what happened to Job. We saw all of his stuff just destroyed and taken away. As the scripture says, Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And then we see Job's health was stricken. And um, we see then that he is in that kind of a situation. And then in chapter 3, we saw Job just, just saying, wow, you know, he was just singing the blues. Look at what's going on with me. Why is this? I wish I was not even born. Job went through all that. All right, and then we went through our uh, uh, situation with our last couple of chapters dealing with one of the friends that were talking to Job, Eliphaz. And Eliphaz is the, the one that came to Job with all the, the um, uh, various uh, reasons why Job should consider that he must have done something wrong. And Eliphaz came through every different kind of way, even tried to be very spiritual and talked about how he had to dream and and so forth, and, and just trying to convince Job, Job, God would not put this on you if you didn't do something wrong. And now, in chapter 6, what we're going to see here is Job is going to answer Eliphaz. Uh, but before I, I, we get into that, let me just say that what, what, what Job is going to answer is Eliphaz's critique. In other words, that's Eliphaz's theology. How does Eliphaz see God? And that's what we got those last couple of uh, chapters. He was trying to show Job, try, trying to show Job, Job, this is how I see God, and this is what, how I think God works. Well, now what we're going to get now is Job's response. It's almost, uh, and I try to draw the analogy, and I, I think I, I mentioned this before. It's almost like when you have, you know, Job's witnesses coming to the house and trying to tell you about the Lord, and and that's kind of true as well. But you know, a, probably a better comparison would be like the debate between the, 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 the uh, Methodist and the Baptist, or the, the, uh, the Catholic and the, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist, and the Pentecostal churches, and the, all these different viewpoints of how we see God and what we think God is doing. When in reality, uh, as we saw when we looked, took a peep at the opening portions where God comes into the picture, he says, None of y'all know what y'all talking about. Y'all all are darkening knowledge with your bad counsel. And so the key then is, can we find true revelation? That's why we need scripture. Because we understand and, and, and rely on and believe that scripture has been given to us as true revelation. Because a lot of us have a lot of ideas and a lot of philosophies. So when we go through this, the reason why I take my time and go through because this is the conversation and what we may see a lot of times is ourselves. We, we see ourselves a lot of times and how we try to do certain things and whatnot. But it's important to recognize that number one, we ain't, we're not perfect and we're never going to be a perfect in, in how we describe God because we can't describe him. He's indescribable. But at the same time, we want to make sure that we try to do what's right. Don't try to just show a whole lot of uh, 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 personal preferences and varieties of, of thought stick to scripture as best we know how. But when it's all said and done, one thing I can rely on, and that is God's going to do with us just like he did in this book of Job. He's going to come and he's going to show forth the truth. And we're going to get a chance to see what is real truth and what is not. So the bottom line is we can rely on that and we can look forward to that. All right. So, uh, we're going to go ahead and get into, uh, oh, I see uh, Leon's coming in. All right. And so, we're going to go ahead and we're going to get into our reading here. How you doing, Leon? Good to see you. Hey, how you doing? I'm good. I'm good. So, we're in, we're in Job chapter 6. Oh, you am moving. Okay. Uh-huh. And so, we're going to go ahead right now and start our reading. So, let's take a listen. Job chapter 6. 
chapter 6. But Job answered and said, Oh, that my grief was thoroughly weighed, and my calamity laid in the balances together. Oh, yeah. For now it would be heavier than the sand of the sea. Therefore my words are swallowed up. For the arrows of the Almighty are within me. The poison whereof drinketh up my spirit. The terrors of God do set themselves in array against me. Doth the wild ass bray when he hath grass? Or loweth the ox over his fodder? Can that which is unsavory be eaten without salt? Or is there any taste in the white of an egg? The things that my soul refused to touch are as my sorrowful meat. Oh, that I might have my request, and that God would grant me the thing that I long for, even that it would please God to destroy me, that he would let loose his hand and cut me off. Then should I yet have comfort. Yea, I would harden myself in sorrow. Let him not spare, for I have not concealed the words of the Holy One. What is my strength that I should hope? And what is mine end, that I should prolong my life? Is my strength the strength of stones, or is my flesh of brass? Is not my help in me, and is wisdom driven quite from me? To him that is afflicted, pity should be shewed from his friend, but he forsaketh the fear of the Almighty. My brethren have dealt deceitfully as a brook, and as the stream of brooks they pass away, which are blackish by reason of the ice, and wherein the snow is hid. What time they wax warm, they vanish. When it is hot, they are consumed out of their place. The paths of their way are turned aside. They go to nothing and perish. The troops of Tima looked. The companies of Sheba waited for them. They were confounded because they had hoped. They came thither and were ashamed. For now ye are nothing. Ye see my casting down and are afraid. Did I say, bring unto me, or give a reward for me of your substance, or deliver me from the enemy's hand, or redeem me from the hand of the mighty? Teach me, and I will hold my tongue, and cause me to understand wherein I have erred. How forcible are right words, but what doth your arguing reprove? Do ye imagine to reprove words, and the speeches of one that is desperate, which are as wind? Yea, ye overwhelm the fatherless, and ye dig a pit for your friend. Now therefore be content, look upon me, for it is evident unto you if I lie. Return, I pray you, let it not be iniquity. Yea, return again, my righteousness is in it. Is there iniquity in my tongue? Cannot my taste discern perverse things? All right, so there we go. Job, uh, part of his response. He's got another uh, part to that response in chapter 7. Uh, but let's take a look at the first part of his response. How you doing, Mother? Good to see you. So, now, what we see here is it says, it starts off, it says, Job answers and said, Oh, that my grief were thoroughly weighed. Now, what he is saying here is, listen, Granted, I'm in grief. Because remember, Eliphaz was telling Job all the reasons why, Job, you've done something and uh, you just need to confess up. And that's why this is happening to you. And now what Job is saying in that, in that uh, uh, first and second verse, it says, And Job answered and said, Oh, that my grief were thoroughly weighed, and my calamities laid in the balance together. He's saying... I wish I had a way that I can measure what I do to help others in comparison to what I do that may have been uh, a bad behavior or something wrong. In other words, he's saying, I haven't done anything wrong. And if you were to measure me properly, Eliphaz, you would see that I'm not the person that you think I am. And then he goes on. He says, for now would I be heavier than the sand of the sea, where, wherefore my words are swallowed up. And so he's saying that I have, I have substance to believe and to think that I have not done nothing wrong. My case is not light. What I'm saying to you is not the kind of stuff that would just blow in the wind. What I'm saying to you is substance. And if you knew me, you would add weight to 
uh, to my words. He says in verse 3, he says, For now it would be heavier than sand of the sand of the sea. Therefore, my words are swallowed up. And then he goes in chapter in verse 4, and he says, For the arrows of the Almighty, Almighty are with me. Within me. Within me. Now, what he is saying here is that if you balance or check on what I'm doing, if you weigh my actions, I don't see anything that I've done wrong. But there is a fact. There is something that's happening. I do have the arrows of the Almighty in me. Now, that's how Job sees it. And you can argue either side of this, because someone will say, well, no, this was an attack of the devil, which is true. But it was an attack of the devil that was allowed by who? By God. All right. So God allowed it. So what Job is saying, I have these arrows within me. And then he says, um, uh, therefore, he says, uh, wherefore drinketh up my spirit. The terror of God do set themselves uh, in array against me. So he recognizes that for whatever reason, God has set this terror, this issue upon me. I can't deny to you that I'm suffering. I can't say that, well, God wouldn't allow this to happen to me because God did. God allowed it to happen to me. He put these arrows within me. But then, you know, what am I to do? I know that I'm not speaking hypocritically. So then he goes on. Look at what he says in verse 5. He says, does the wild ass bray when they have grass or, or lower the ox over the fodder? In other words, he's saying, when does a wild, when, when is a donkey going to cry? He's not crying when he has food. When that, when that donkey, when that wild ass has plenty of grass to eat, he's content. So he's saying to Eliphaz, Eliphaz, when I was laying out my heart in chapter 3 and complaining and giving you the blues, I'm not giving you the blues over uh, a full life and full situation. I'm giving you blues because I'm like a starving donkey. I have nothing now. The pain that you feel when you're hungry, my spirit feels that right now because my spirit is starving. I don't know what's going on. My soul is hurt. His, you, know, you know when you get your feelings hurt? And you just feel bad. And it's just like you can't understand why. And that's what he's saying. So he's trying to tell Aliphaz, as well as the other uh, friends that are there, that they're going to have something to say in just a bit. And he's letting them know, listen, man. I mean, you wouldn't be upset with a, with a hungry donkey that was just crying. You wouldn't, be, you wouldn't criticize an ox that was uh, crying out because it didn't have any fodder or food. You would have compassion on it. You would say, oh, that poor donkey, look at him crying because he's hungry. Eliphaz didn't give that to Job, and Job was pointing that out. You didn't even give me the fact of saying, Job, I understand, man, you hurt. You have a reason to cry. Right? But he goes on. Verse 6. He says, uh, Can that which is uh, unsavory. unsavory be eaten without salt? Or is there any taste in the white of an egg? So now he's talking about things that you look for and hope for but don't get. There's nothing like looking at a wonderful plate of food and you're just looking at it and you're like, wow, it looks good. And then you go and you put it in your mouth and it has no taste. Can you imagine that? You know, what, what does that do to your, your, your appetite? You, you're sitting there, you're prepared, you're in life, you're enjoying it. And you're at that point where this is where the flavor kicks in. And that's where Job was. Job had a lot of things in life. His children were doing well. And he was at that stage in life where things should, the seasoning of his, uh, of his life should have been ongoing in his mind. And now he's recognizing that he has no flavor. I have nothing. 
I have nothing to turn to. I can't turn to my wealth. I can't turn to my, my status, uh, my employment, because all my servants were put to death. I, don't, I can't turn to my children. And in the situation, even my wife feels bad for me to the point where she says, you probably should curse God and die. No taste, no feeling. Basically, he's feeling what? He's feeling alone. I'm going through the motion of eating, but I don't taste any flavor. So he's saying, I'm living, but this ain't living. I'm alive, but this is not what life is about. His life is what he's saying has no flavor and no taste. All right. And uh, I think we can all at some point recognize, you know, I, I, I've seen this before. I, I mean, have you been in a situation where you're like, you know, I, this is not the way I expected things to be. I'm going to unmute it in case anybody wants to say anything. Have you been in that kind of situation where you like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, you know, Life seems like it should be good, but then it's tasteless. It should be nice, but it's like it, it's, it has no flavor. It's not that it tastes bad. It's just that it has no flavor. See, things that taste bad, you spit it out. But, you know, this has, it's, it's, not, it's not good. It's not awful. It's just black. And Job is saying, that's how my life is right now. Yeah, you can only do that with food, though. <laughs> that's true. You can't spit out regular life, can you? That's, that's right. You're right about that, Wayne. And the way I feel sometimes, I can't spit it out. Just have to deal with it. You just got to deal with it. That's right. Yep. That's, uh, that's exactly right. And so that's what Job's trying to explain here. All right. And so he goes on in, in verse 7. He says, The things that my soul refused to touch are as my sorrowful meat. So he's basically saying, I'm at a point where there were things I wouldn't even think about or consider that now I have to deal with. You think about that sometimes when you're dealing with life and sometimes you think, I don't ever want to have to deal with... I, I remember, I'll give me an example. I remember one, one, one time, and this was a situation where I, I don't know exactly, I can't remember all the components, but I remember trying to get to work and I recognized that I had nothing like I had no resource, I had no money, and I had to go and count pennies. I don't know if y'all been there. This is you know many years ago, but I remember like it was yesterday. Oh. Is I that had... why you married Penny? <laughs> 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 you just got jokes. Now, now, now you want now you want see I gotta stay here, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I had to count pennies to get me some gas to get to work. And I remember saying to myself, and I remember the feeling, I was like, what is going on with me where, where I have to now go in here and hand this man, you know, seven, eight rolls of pennies just to get enough gas to go to work. And you're just feeling like, you know, this is not where I want to be. I, I, I didn't plan to be here. I didn't, I, I wasn't looking for this. The things that my soul did not ever want to deal with, guess what? Man, I'm dealing with it. Right. Yeah, well, that's just like my older sister. You know, when Barbara's talking to her on the phone, Barbara already put the phone on speaker, so she asked Barbara. She said, Barbara, is he down? I said, you can ask me if I'm down. She said, oh, I didn't know you were listening. I said, yeah, I'm listening. I said, what be, what, why should I be down? If I feel down, I'm not going to get any better. Mm -hmm. You know? So, I mean, what I'm going through is something that I have to deal with. I had no choice but to deal with it. But I'm not going to sit around here and tell I had a stroke. I'm not going to do that. Right. You know, because, like I said, hey, with that prayer protection, I read it every day. Mm -hmm. It's telling me right there, don't worry, I got you. God got me. So why should I worry about anything? Right. I just got to wait to get back. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. No, but if I start running around here moping and stuff, I never get right. That's right. That's right. You know. Yep. So that's the thing. We 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 recognize. You know, you see people that uh, I have friends of mine. I mean, y'all remember some of the friends we knew uh, from uh, from Faith Temple? They they got married, and the next thing you know, they're dealing with divorce, and they're they're dealing with situations that you didn't you didn't expect to have to go through or to deal with. But those things happen. Um, and then when you're dealing with them, you know, you recognize that it, it's, 
it seems strange because it's almost like you expect that to happen to other people, but not you. But now here you are dealing with it. Now, the one thing we can inject from that, because we have scripture to, to, to answer this, is that when you go through these things, you, you have to just believe God's going to bring you through. You didn't plan for it. You didn't set up any boundaries or, or, or protections for it because you didn't think that was going to be an issue, but now it is. And you're still going to have to learn to lean on the Lord. Uh, and the Lord tells us to cast our cares on Him and because um, he, he cares for us. All right. Look at verse 8. He says, Oh, that um, I might request uh, and that God would grant me the thing that I long for. So now Job is saying, there's one thing I want. This is one thing I want God to request. And he's, this is a prayer that he had. And he's kind, of, he's kind of reaching back out to what he was talking about in chapter 3. Look what he says. Even that uh, it, would be, it would please God to destroy me. And, and that's strong word because it's not saying... He's not saying that he would die. Job is going deeper than that. He doesn't want to say I'm ready to die. Job is hoping that I never live. Because that's what he was, remember, in verse in, in chapter 3. Job was hoping it would have been better for me not to be what? To be born. So what he's saying is I want, it, I want God to destroy me. Just erase the record that I just eat, don't even exist. So I don't have to even have memory of having stuff and then losing it. I don't want that that pain. Being able to do and now I can't do. I don't want that pain. Being able to have and now I don't have. Job is saying, I don't want that pain. I want God to destroy me. That he would uh, let loose his hand and cut me off. Alright? So he's still sticking to what he was kind of feeling in chapter 3, but he's going to get back to Eliphaz here in just a bit. Look at chapter, look at verse 3. I'm sorry, verse uh, 10. Then should I yet have comfort. Yea, I would harden myself in sorrow. Let me not snare, uh, spare, for I have not concealed the words of the Holy One. Alright. Um, he says, I have not uh, uh, counseled the words of the Holy One. That's important to keep in mind because one thing that we do need is we we can sometimes feel like God has not given us direction. And we can feel like God has not shown us the way. But one thing we can keep in mind is that whether we hear counsel from God or not, He said, I will, He said, Jesus said, Lord, I am with you always. I will never leave you, nor what? Forsake you. So when we like feel... His spirit is broke. His spirit is broke. So when we feel like like for I have not counseled the words of the of, of of the Holy One. We got no conversation with God, nothing that we feel like we're getting back. We today, because we're blessed to know that Jesus has already come and He's already died for us, and He's let us know through Scripture that He will never leave us nor forsake us. And the thing that we can keep in mind that it doesn't matter what we're going through. See, Job right now, he can't leave. He don't have that scripture. So he's going on his own theology. He's going on his own uh, uh, conversation that he is used to having when he was counseling people in the past. Verse 11. What is my strength? All right. Today, we know what our strength is. We know the answer to that question. Job doesn't know right now. He's like, what is my strength? That I should hope. Right? So Job is like, well, what do I hope in? I can't understand this. I've been given nothing, and so far from what Eliphaz has said to him, that first friend, Job's not getting anything that's making sense. He says, he says so what is my strength or, or, or that I should hope? And what is my end? Alright. Job doesn't know. What's going to happen? See, we know our end. Rather, because Paul said to be absent from the uh, from the uh, the body is to be what present with the Lord. Exactly. So um, we know our end. We know how it's going to turn out. 
Job is like, what is my end? That I should prolong my life. Why? So he's like, I don't have any strength. I have no hope. And I have no reason for life to go on. And he goes back to go back to what he said in verse 9. I, I wish that God would give me what I would desire. And that is that he would destroy me. He's still talking. Uh, uh, in the situation of just a broken man. And now. Anyone that is going through what Job's going through. Has a right to feel broken. I think one of the most important things that he did say. And that was when he was talking in verse in verse 5, where he said, If a donkey is crying because it has nothing to eat, wouldn't you have compassion on that donkey? If an ox is crying because it had no food, wouldn't you have compassion? So when you when you understand why someone's hurting, why are you, you coming accusing? So you wouldn't go to a to the donkey that, that you know is starving and say, Well, would you just stop that noise? Hush up. You would say, no, let me give you something to eat. Or let me at least understand. I understand why you're... Job is not saying, I'm not getting any of this. I have no strength. I have no hope. And I don't even know why my life is being prolonged. Look at verse 12. Is my strength the strength of stone? He goes, I'm not a stone. I have what? I have feeling. I'm flesh and blood. Flesh and blood. So when you, when you hit me, I hurt. When, when you take my children as a father, I feel pain. I'm not a rock. I'm not a stone. Or is my flesh of brass? You can take brass and put it in the fire, and that brass is, is in the fire. You put flesh in the fire, that flesh burns up. You feel pain. So once again, Job is saying, listen, man, I'm not made of stone, and I'm not made of brass. If you hurt if you heard me whining and crying and pleading in chapter 3, it's because I'm human, dude. I feel pain. I know what hurt is, and I'm hurting. My soul is empty. I have no idea as to what's happening. And we can all, once again, go back. Job doesn't have the access that we got in chapter 1 and 2. He don't know that God and Satan had a conversation. He don't know that God said... There's nobody like Job. He don't know that God was bragging on him. God was talking great things about Job. And God is watching this. Job is not by himself. Job is right there with him. I mean, I'm saying God is right there with Job. And that's the thing that sometimes we forget. And Job doesn't know this. All right? So it's important for us to, to, uh, to keep that in mind. All right? So look at verse 13. And it says, Is not my help in me? And is wisdom driven uh, quiet from me? Quite from me. So he's like, is, he said, Can I help myself? He's like, Is my help in me? Can I bring, can I fix this myself? And the answer is no. Can you fix your own sin? Mm -mm. No. No. You can't do that. So Job is like, well, can I fix my own self? Is the, is, the, is the wisdom to do this the kind of wisdom that I have? No, you know, we're not smart enough. We're not clever enough to fix ourselves. Verse 14. To him that is afflicted, pity should be showed from his friends. But he forsaketh the fear of the Almighty. Now, Job is letting Eliphaz know, number one, to him that's afflicted, Eliphaz, you should show uh, some pity. You should show some care. You should show some compassion. All right. But then he's saying, but he uh, forsaketh the fear of the Almighty. What should I? What am I supposed to think about the Almighty? I mean, wh wh what what idea do I have about why is he allowing this? And we can then turn that once again to ourselves. Um, why do we go through stuff? Why do we uh, have to endure hardship and, and, and disappointment and frustration and pain and sorrow? Why do we... Well, we, when we think of that one, you know, the Bible says, should Christ suffer in the flesh and the world go free? And don't the Bible say something about arm yourself likewise? Mm-hmm. If Christ suffered in the flesh. That's right. 
Yeah, there's there's something there's something um, beyond. I mean, we understand that you know that there's a there's a lot of corollaries that we can just say about the benefit of struggle. You could talk about it on many levels. I mean, we kind of talked about that in the beginning part of Job. You know, a person that wants to build muscle, well, they got to have a struggle with a with a weight bar. Uh, you want to learn, um, uh, get a degree, well, you're gonna have to struggle in in school and and study, and um, you know all the different things. When, when it comes to good parenting, you struggle with raising the kids and showing them right and wrong, and and all that is. And we can we can easily see that. Okay, those difficulties and those issues have a a good outcome if you handle it properly for the most part. And to some degree, uh, that applies to all kinds of situations in a lot of different fields. The big question is why? What is it about struggle? There's something to it even beyond that. What's the true nature spiritually about struggle? God knows. Which is why when you even go back to the very first book of the Bible, you get the first, first couple of chapters, you see Adam and Eve in the garden. Things seem good. Why does God allow Satan to come into the garden? There's something about that struggle. Now, you can talk about the fact that, well, if God wants to make us like him, we're in his image. God said, I'm going to make man in my what? In my image. God has choice. He can do He can do, and he cannot do. Well, to make us in his image, guess one of the things that he, he decided to give us was what? Choice. But then, if you only got good to choose, do you really have a choice? No. You see? So therefore, is it situation where God says, well, in order to have a choice, and I made Adam and Eve in my image, I then have to give them the opportunity to choose. And then he gave them one thing to choose from. And that was, here's a tree, don't eat of it. Eat from everything else, you can have all the other stuff on the in the garden, but just don't eat from here. So now they, got a, they, they have a decision to make. You now have a free will, which once again, if we're going to be truly made in the image of God, God says, well, I, I have free will to do uh, what I desire to do, uh, but I know how to do because I'm God, but if I'm going to make them in my image, I have to give them that too. So it gets deep to the point where I, I get kind of lost in my thinking and in my understanding that there is a reason even deeper than what we can understand. And when we get to the portion of Job where God begins to inter, uh, 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 in, interrupt the conversation and he points out stuff, he's going to tell Job and his friends, well, tell me about this. and tell me He's going to bring up all these different topics and all these different subjects and ask them to tell him about how that works. Now, what's interesting is that he gives them all these things, but he never... God never tells him how it works. He's just showing you your ignorance, which is one of the things I think this book is, 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 is primed to help us understand. You don't know as much as sometimes you th we think we do. We think we, well, I know how God works. No, we don't know how God works. We don't even know God. We just know what God has revealed to us. We know what, what God has showed us. We know what God has, has enlightened us and given us the revelation to understand. But God is way bigger and way more than what we can even comprehend. And that's what Job is saying here. You know, he's like, I, I, I don't even know if I can even have a conversation. I don't even know where to begin. Because I'm, 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 I don't have any wisdom. Uh, and the help to be able to deliver myself is not in me. So uh, that's where he's at there in verse 13. Look at verse 14. To, to him that is afflicted, pity should be shown. Okay, we read that already. All right. Yes. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're on verse 15. I'm sorry. My, yes. my brethren have dealt deceitfully as a brook. Now, he's talking about, now, now he's going right at Eliphaz. And he says, okay, my brethren has dealt deceitfully as a brook. All right, think of a brook. 
you know, back in that day. It's like you walk up and you see a brook. Oh, you're thinking about what? Fresh water, right? All right. Keep in mind, a stream of brooks they pass uh, uh, away. So he's like, I'm I'm looking when I saw you and Bildad and Eli uh, uh, and and, uh, and Zophar coming. I looked at you guys like a traveler would look at a brook. Wow, this is good. But then when I when I saw the brook got closer, it what? It passed away. It was like a mirage in the desert. But he goes on. 16. Which uh, are, are blackish by, by reason of the ice. Alright? So he's given another one. He goes, I see this situation that looks like ice. And we're in the snow is hid. For a time, verse 17, for a time they wax warm. They what? They vanish. All right. So now he's talking about another situation. He says, "You look and you see the wonderful. Uh, you see the snow and the ice, and it's there. But then the, mo the the minute it gets warm, what happens? It vanishes. Once it gets hot, they are consumed out of their place. The paths uh, of of their way are turned aside. They go to nothing and perish." All right, those paths that the, that the water takes when it's, when it's moving, once it gets hot, what happens? That water dries up. So what he's doing, he's making a picture here. He's, tr he's trying to show Eliphaz how you look to me right now. And he's using this description of, 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 of water and, uh, and, 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 and uh, how you look forward to it when you're traveling, but then all of a sudden it's not there. All right? And then he goes on. Now he gives it another example. Look at verse 19. The truce of Tima. He's saying, when you have a bunch of people coming, they look uh, at the company of Sheba. Wait for them. They were comforted because they had what? Hope. They came thither and they were ashamed. For now ye are nothing. Ye see my, uh, my casting down uh, and are afraid. So, that whole group of verses there, from verse 15 to, to 20, Job is trying to give an illustration, basically. He's trying to let Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar know. When I saw you guys coming, I was like, wow, I'm in pain. I done lost everything, but here come my friends. Here come my buddies. And you guys look to me like a brook, like a cool piece of ice on a, on a hot day. You just look like a good, refreshing situation. As I watched y'all walk up here. And y'all came here. Y'all didn't say anything for seven days. Y'all just sat there. And then Eliphaz opened his mouth. And all of a sudden. That brook dried up. That ice melted. <laughs> the truth was disappointed. I have nothing. And he's like I have nothing to hope for. And I feel ashamed. Not only for myself but for you. Because he's in 21. He says, you are nothing. You see my casting down and are afraid. He goes, you, you, you. And, and when, you use the, when he's using this word afraid, he's like, y'all are nervous because you don't know what's happening. But you're trying to tell me what's happening. You don't know what's happening. And, and that's what they should say. And that's a good example even to us. Being able to just say, I don't know why God's allowing you to go through this. I really don't. Those are some of the best words you can say to somebody that's hurting, that's going through, and they want to, if they, and especially if they ask you, why am I going through this? And um, sometimes we it's try, sad. we try it to, it seems like, mm -hmm. it seems like the same thing happens to us so many times when, when we are looking to people, you know, and we are thinking that they're going to, bring the good to us and then that time comes and they end up a disappointment exactly. you know what I mean so you know so we feel let down and we know that the only person that we can really truly trust the one that always remains faithful is God himself exactly. but just to show you how sometimes the people even the people the closest us at any given moment can let us down exactly. you know we're depending on them we're looking to them and all of a sudden um, they come with the wrong with, with the wrong motives or just doing the wrong things, saying the wrong things, and there's just so much disappointment. But mm -hmm. 
you know, and that brings a lot of discouragement sometimes when we put too much trust in people. That's right. That's right. I, I, I can give you an, an example. I'm sure y'all probably can remember this. I remember back in the day when I first started, you know, really getting into to, to Bible study, I really enjoyed this preacher, Jimmy Swaggart. I don't know if y'all remember him. Yes. <laughs> Everybody do. I'm telling you, man, that was my guy for a while, man. I, I, I Jimmy Swaggart was the it. I had to watch him, you know, because I just, I was just, you know, it was something about him. And, uh, you know, when he started going through his stuff, man, I was disappointed. Just like Leon said, man, I was like, like, come on, man, really? You know, and I, and I, and I know nobody's perfect. And I don't, I'm not saying Jimmy Swaggart is, you know, now going to die and burn and go to hell. I think he's, you know, I think he's a man of God like, 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 you know, a lot of them are. But what happens is you put the wrong trust. And see, and this is what, uh, you know, their whole philosophy uh, and the theology of Job's day is putting counsel and, and, and hope and trust in somebody. And like Leon said, we recognize the only person that you can put trust in that you know won't let you down is Jesus. And that's Amen. you gotta put your trust in God. And you can you can even look at people that you know care for you can still hurt your feelings. Yeah. You know, people that you know love you can hurt your feelings and make you feel bad and you feel let down. And so this is what you know you pull from this conversation as we're listening to Job and he's pointing this out. And uh, he goes on. Uh, where are we at? 22? He says, he says did, I, did I say, bring unto me or give me a reward? So Job was saying, did I ask anybody for any reward? When, so when he's saying, I know I've done things right. But even the things that I did right, I wasn't doing them for wrong motives. He said, I didn't ask for any reward. Uh, uh, for me or any of your substance when I did anything for anybody I didn't ask anybody to give me anything I did it because I wanted to do it to help 23 or deliver me from the enemy's, from the enemy's hand I didn't say well I'm going to do this but I want you to be my ally if I ever get in trouble I want you to help me I want you know so we're trying to build some alliances so I'm helping you but I have another motive behind why I'm helping you because I want me and you to be friends so when enemies come, you know, we, we have an alliance. Deliver me from the enemy's hand or redeem me from the hand of the mighty. You know, talking about some of the same things. So Job is going on. He's like, you know, I didn't do these things um, uh, any good that I did with that kind of motive. So what Job is trying to basically tell, tell Eliphaz, I'm not a hypocrite. I might not be perfect. And, I, and, I, and Job is saying, I know I'm not perfect, but I'm not a hypocrite. I wasn't trying to present one thing and do another. I was who I was. Then he goes on. 24. Teach me and I will hold my tongue. In other words, show me something. Educate me if you know. You know? And then if you, if you actually can teach me something, I won't say nothing back. Well, we know that's not going to happen because they're going to say things and Joe's going to keep saying things back. And cause me to understand wherein I have erred. Can you really show me where I have gone wrong? See, that's the beauty of, of, of the scripture, the gospel, and, the, and, the, and the, the epistles that we have. And, you know, especially like the book of Romans. We can see that we are born in sin, shaped in iniquity. We know our error. We know that, that, that there is nothing perfect in us. We know, scripture tells us, that our best righteousness the best we can do is like what? Filthy rags. Filthy rags. So, therefore, we already know this about it. We've already looked at ourselves in the mirror of Scripture and found out we need help. We've come to that conclusion through Scripture. All right? And so what Job is saying, can you show me this? Well, we thank God because Jesus has shown us. Paul, through the Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, has showed that to us. He has helped us. He has used wisdom. You know, he has done that to me. But at this particular point in history, Job hasn't gotten that. But we do know this that Job doesn't know. God already talked about Job. God already said, This is a man perfect 
and the way that you know we describe how what God said is perfect, being complete. And this is a man. There's none like him. God already bragged about Job. Job just don't know that. So imagine you going through all that you're going through, and God's up in in the spiritual realm talking about how great you are. Look at how good He's doing, and you're struggling. But God's bragging on you. He's bragging on you in the spiritual realm, and you are hurt. He's bragging on you to all the angels and to all the demons. Y'all can't do nothing with that guy. But yet you are in pain. But God is just talking about how wonderful you are. All right? And so sometimes we have to keep that in mind. Because we see what Job is going through. But we also know what God said about Job. Alright. Let's finish up here. What are we at? Uh, what was that? Uh, 24? He said, teach me and I will hold my tongue. We read that in 25. Uh, uh, how forcible are right words. Wow. I mean, I could talk a while on that. But that's what the people said about Jesus. Nobody talks like this guy. Because Jesus came with what? Right words. He came with the, he came with the word of God. He came powerful. How forceful forcible are right words but what doeth your uh, arguing reprove so what but what are you doing Eliphaz 26 do you imagine to reprove words and to uh, and the speech of one uh, that is uh, uh, desperate. desperate which as the wind so are you trying to talk to somebody that is in a situation where they would almost take anything you got to say. It's one of the things where we have the you know laws in our land uh, where we have minors and and, and adults because see um, a, a, an adult has enough worldly know-how to use words that can trick a child or sometimes even a young teenager into doing something that's just going to get them in trouble. And so what he's saying here is, um, you know, the, 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 the words of the speech that you have are like, you know, that, that you're talking to somebody that's desperate and they're like the wind. And if I stay light minded, I'm going to end up blowing with your words. I'm going to go with him. I'm going to go with the wind. Jesus said about John the Baptist. He said, when you went out to the wilderness to look and to listen to John the Baptist, what did you go out to see? A reed blowing in the wind? He said, no, nah, John's not that kind of guy. John's not the kind of guy that when the wind blows left, he's going to lean left. And when the wind blows right, he's going to lean right. John's hold up. He's steady on the word and on the truth. So Joel was like, you guys, are, are you expecting me to just take what you say and go with it? You think I'm not desperate for any kind of, okay, that must be what it is. I want the truth. And that's the thing about trying to find the truth is you're not really just comfortable with just anything. You want to dig. And you go through. Not I don't want the excited. I don't want the one that just sounds wonderful. I don't want the popular one either. I want the truth. Now, if the truth happens to be popular, fine. If the truth happens to be exciting, fine. All right? But if the truth is is out there by itself, lonely and boring, then guess what I'm going to need? I'm going to need the truth. Alright? 27. Yea, ye overwhelm the fatherless. In other words, you know, you go to people that are struggling and your wind and your words are strong enough to overwhelm them. But what Job was letting them know, he's like, that's not going to happen to me. He goes, and ye dig a pit for your friend. See, so you, 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 your words are digging this pit and you're just thinking, I'm going to just jump in it. I'm not. What Joe was letting them know, listen, I am not a hypocrite. You didn't, you, you, this is not why I'm suffering. I don't know why I'm suffering. I don't know why the, 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 the arrows of the Almighty are in me. But what you said is not true. I'm not stealing nobody. I didn't do anything for reward. I'm not trying to get any kind of alliance. I'm suffering for something I don't know why. 
and I can't answer. But I'm not going to agree with you that I must have done something purposely on wrong, uh, wrong, and that's why God is punishing me. Twenty-eight. Now, therefore, be content. Look upon me, for it is evident unto you if I lie. Now he's saying, now I want you to be to be uh, 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 content with this. Be satisfied with this. Look upon me. Do you know me? You of all people should have enough evidence to know whether I'm lying or not. All right? So now he's letting them know. You should know better than this. You should be here just like with me saying I don't know what they I don't know why. But they're trying to be theological in their help. They're trying to be spiritual in their help. They're trying to be deep <laughs> in their help. Rather than just saying, listen, what, the only thing I do know is God is good. Now, and all this other stuff as to why something might be happening to you, I, I, I can't say. Sometimes we can know. All right? If a person is uh, doing drugs and, you know, they get some kind of uh, abnormality because they're doing the drugs, well, we can say, well, you know, she hadn't done the drugs. There's certain things that we can apply to. But in this particular case, there's nothing that you can point to. And they should say that. Job, I'm looking, and I know you. I can't answer this, man. I can't see why anything that you've done that will cause you to lose all your cattle, your camels, your, your donkeys, lose your children, and your health. Job, I have never seen you do anything that's worthy of that. And that's what they should say, but that's not what they're saying. All right, so we finish up with this, 29. He says, return, I pray you. Let it not be, uh, let it not be uh, iniquity. Yet, uh, yea, return again, my righteousness is in me. So he's saying, uh, he's saying, my, 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 my focus is on the fact that there is a issue, but don't try to say the iniquity uh, is something that's in me. My righteousness is in it. So he said, I mean, I have iniquity, but that's not what I am. See, we do sin, but we are not sin. We do uh, make mistakes, but we are not the mistake. You know, so there are differences in how, how you look at that. Verse 30. Is there iniquity uh, in my tongue? Cannot, uh, cannot my taste uh, discern uh, perverse things? So he's saying, now listen. Just like how when you, when you, you and he's using an example again. He's saying, when you taste something with your tongue, you taste it, you know what it is. So he's saying that my, my nature and my spirit is like a tongue. I can taste certain things uh, mentally, uh, spiritually, socially, and can say there's something bad about that. Just like how when you can taste something with your tongue and you can say, wow, there's something bad with that and you don't want it no more. And Joel was trying to tell his friends, I am developed and know enough that when I taste something, I kind of know what it is. I'm not tasting iniquity. That's not what I'm, that's not the flavor that's coming back at me. And so he's trying to let uh, his friend Eliphaz know. That's not what it is, man. And then uh, he, he, he's going to go on and say a few other things, but that's in the next chapter. We're going to stop here. Well, as you can see, as we're taking our time and we're going through this verse by verse, word by word, and like a fly on the wall looking and trying to understand and see what it is that Job is really um, dealing with here. And it seems like, excuse me, it seems like to me he lost his faith. Well, I'm not going to say he lost his faith. I think he's confused. Yeah, I think I, I, I can see that. Yeah, I think what he is is he, he believes in God. And now let me say this too. And I said this. Uh, I think uh, Leon had asked that question the last time he was here. He wanted to know if um, his friends were saved. 
and and I and I gave the answer, and I think I can you know show as we go through this that Job's friends, though they have incomplete theology, are not against God. They are God fearing people. Uh, I think they want to know God. The problem is. They're not letting God reveal himself in his time. They're trying to step in front of God and they're going to be God's voice. Uh -huh. And what that does is it does just what, you, what we talked about. It brings confusion. So you look at... It brings the wrong message too. It definitely brings the wrong message. But you, you look at our, our world today, even with scripture. And we got so many different uh, cults and different things and people try to use the Bible... To benefit themselves for what they're trying to get, and some of it is very obvious. You know, when you sit night, up late at night and you see the guy talking about the, you know, the Bible, and this thing, he know that I need you to send me an offering. You know, so well, you know, we know what that guy's all about, right? So you know, we can, you know, you can obviously see that. That's something you can taste and go, okay, I, I know why he does that. But there are, there are a lot of other things. Sometimes we look at it where people will say certain things, and sometimes they'll say things that you like. But at the other, but other times they'll say things that you that you are like. Wow, why would they say that? Well, it's because they're human, not because they don't love God. And so, what this book is bringing forth and and going to show us, and we'll see ourselves a lot of times in this, is that when you are trying to explain to to people why God does things, you're going to end up in a situation like this. The things that God has already revealed to us, why he does things, are in scripture. The things that God does that we cannot truly understand or comprehend, we don't know. And we need to really just recognize that. I don't know. I, 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 I'm not sure. Now, does that mean that we can never um, uh, share an opinion or speculate or give uh, what we consider to be calculated thought. No, we can do that. But it's, I think it's important to say that you need to tell people, you know, I'm just thinking that this is my thought on this. God didn't tell me this. I didn't have no dream in the middle of the night, and no spirit talked to me. This is just something I'm thinking in, in my head. And there's nothing wrong with sharing your thoughts. You know, somebody said, well, well, what's your opinion on this? Well, here's my opinion. This is what I think about it. That don't make it right, but this is, this is my opinion. You know, we have a lot of stuff that, that we don't know. People talk about um, uh, the rapture. I, my opinion is, I think the rapture is going to happen before the tribulation gets here. That's my opinion. And I, and I, and I hold to it, and I can, I can show you why I feel that way. But I'm not going to tell you God told me the rapture is going to happen before the tribulation. Uh, he's given us reasons to believe both, and you can go. I can, you can go to scripture and see where it kind of leans to both. Well, it could be maybe there's more than one rapture. Maybe there's two. Maybe one's gonna be before the tribulation and one after, and one in the middle. But if you ask me my opinion, I'm gonna tell you my opinion. But I'm not gonna tell you God told me that. I'm gonna tell you this is what I believe based on that. So there are even with. Scripture. There are a lot of things that God has left for us just to say, trust me on this. You know, just let me show you. Leon Go ahead, Leon. You know, um, the, the, the kind of feeling I'm getting from this, because one of the questions that people do ask, uh, a lot of non-Christians, even Christian folks ask the question, why does God allow us to suffer? Mm -hmm. And like you're saying, you can't particularly answer that question straight out. But we also know through Scripture that suffering is a part of, of our walk with Christ, that we will go through things. But then Peter said something. Peter said that even if we suffer, you know, don't suffer as a murderer or evildoer or busybody, right. yes. you know, when we are going through this thing. But if you suffer for the sake of Christ, yes. then Christ is glorified through your suffering. So even though we don't realize, you know, we don't understand quite everything that looks like you're saying, why certain things come into our lives? Here's, here's Job, a righteous man, and here the last part, he's saying, I did nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. 
You know what I mean? But yet still, here I am. He know he was as so far as being right, so far as, you know, living a godly life. He know that he had not done anything to way out of character or anything like that to bring anything on himself. But yet still, he found himself in that situation. But now the issue, I think, becomes how do, what is, what is going to be your response in that particular situation? That becomes the issue. Right. You know, and I know that, I know a lot of people ask me, say, you know, well, why do you think God would allow that to happen in somebody's life? I, I don't know. You know, I just know how we should respond to it. That's mm -hmm. the only part that I know in it. You know? Exactly, exactly. That's it. Exactly. You know, you know, uh, you know Elder Hughes, you, before I had the stroke, remember when I had to read that prayer protection in church? Yeah. And I was in the hospital, and I was in the hospital, and I said I was going to read my Bible. And before I read my Bible, or well, after I read my Bible, I will always read this prayer of protection. And I read it every day faithfully. Right. And it says, prayer of protection, it says, the Lord is my refuge, my place of safety, my God. You're back, bro. I can see you. For he will rescue me from every trap and protect me from deadly diseases. His faithful promise what happened? armor and protection. I will not hear anybody. Can you hear me, I can hear you, but I see Elder Hughes, but he's not responding. I will not be afraid of the terrorists. He's on mute. Nor the arrows that fly in the day. I will not dread the diseases that start, start in the darkness, nor the disasters that strike in midday. Though a thousand or ten thousand fall at my side, these evils will not touch me if I make the Lord my refuge and make the most high my shelter. No evil will conquer me. No plague will come near my home, for he will order his angels to protect me wherever I go. They will hold me up with their hands, so I won't even hurt my foot on the stone. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in times of trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I reward, will reward them with long life and get them my salvation. Amen. All right. This prayer of protection has made my faith. It's, it's, it's just, that can nothing happen to me. You know, if God don't want something to happen to me, it's not going to happen. Right. And that's what I try to tell people. You know, I tell people, I don't worry about the stroke. I don't know when I'm going to get better, but I'm going to get better. I'm not worried about the coronavirus because this tells me right here, if I trust in him, he got my back. Right. You know, as long as I don't go out there and do anything stupid, it's not nothing for me to worry about because if he wants me to get the virus, I can stay in my house and nobody come in here and get it. Mm -hmm. Just by opening my front door. Yeah. And also, I just say to myself, I'm going to tell my sister Barbara, Barbara, I'm not worried about it because I'm not going to let this, nothing stress me out no more. There you go. You know, and, and I, like I said, I read it every day. And every day, just like the first two lines, it says, The Lord is my refuge, my place of safety, my God in whom I trust. How can I go wrong? That's right. That's right. You know? Now, um, I, I think one of the things that I was, I, I'm going to, uh, consider, uh, and I may do this uh, in our next study, um, there is a, 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 a interpretation of, this, of the scripture called the message, and I don't know if any of you have ever read that, but I was reading through it and look, going through this, this new uh, story of Job, and so I might play that in addition to uh, our King James, just so you can just, just see how in modern language it may sound. And you might sound, you may see it sounds a whole lot like how we talk today. It's like, just like uh, our brother Wayne was just talking about. You know, you don't know why you're going through some stuff, but, and then you can kind of, you know, get a feel for what he's saying. But uh, like uh, Wayne said, and even uh, uh, Leon, what you were saying, uh, I think that's what you pull from this book. You know, you pull, when you read this, um, you're going to pull a lot of information about, wow, this is how I have to make sure when I'm dealing with people, they come to me with these questions. Can I be a little better than Job's friends? Nobody's perfect. 
You're not going to always have the answer. But can I at least be straight? Don't try to be sophisticated. And like uh, Penny said, don't try to get deep, so to speak, all the time. Just, just give people the truth. And I think that's one of the wonderful things about this book. It helps us to, to remember that, number one, when people are hurting, they are really hurting. That, you know, Job is in real pain. And you got to keep that in mind. And we always need to make sure that we do that. And then they're hurting enough and they deserve the truth. Not a made-up answer. They deserve the truth. Oh, but that's just like a lot of my neighbors come by. They say, when you act like you're not worried about nothing, they say, why? I say, it's here. Read this. And I give them the prayer protection. They say, oh, oh. I say, no, keep it. I have plenty of them. Right. You know? And I tell them, I say, read it every morning. You'll see why I don't worry. And that's why I don't worry. Read that every day and read my Bible every day because right now I'm on King James II. And I'm moving right along. You know, like I said, and... I don't, I don't know, it's just, it's just that I don't fear anything. I don't fear anything. Like I said, God has me, had me for 62 years. All the stuff that I've done out in the street, and I'm still here, you know, just like a lot of people tell me, oh, well, if you probably was in a handicapped apartment, that would have never happened to you. I said, that's how you feel. I said, God just put me in so I'd be prepared for it. Hmm. You know, that's how I look at it. Right, right. You know, he put me here so I could be prepared so I didn't have to go to the city. I didn't have to go to other places. I could leave there and come home. Right. You know? Well, and that's the thing. The, the Lord knows uh, what we are dealing with, and that's the comfort, and we're going we're gonna to close with that. Um, and, and, and just keeping in mind, um, as we go through this, uh, uh, Job's friends thought they were really trying to be spiritual when really you just need to be helpful. Be truthful. Tell folks the, 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 the real uh, uh, gospel. Give them the real answer. Show them scripture. Give them God. Not your theories, not your ideas, and not your philosophies. And I think you will always find that the Lord will, will watch over and bless you. Alright, we're going to stop there. Uh, Leon, would you, yes, me, would you do me a favor and, and give us uh -huh. a give us a prayer to go to, to, to depart with? Okay. Amen. Well, Father, we just thank you once again for your love and your kindness and your mercy toward us, oh God. We uh, thank you for the wonderful gift of salvation, oh God. We just thank you, God, for all that you do for us, oh God. And God, we trust in you and you alone do we trust. We thank you for this night, uh, for the study, for the man of God that has brought your word tonight and explained it to us, oh God. Uh, we pray that you will continue to use him, oh God, to feed your people, oh God. And God, I pray for each and every person that has come on to this, uh, this line tonight to receive your word. I pray, oh God, that what we have received tonight, oh God, that it will resonate deep within our spirit, oh God, and that you will give us the grace, oh God, to live out what we are being taught, oh God, uh, so we can be effective for your kingdom, God. Help us to be faithful to you, God. Help us to remain faithful, oh God, until the end, oh God, that we may not grow weary and give up, oh God. So we thank you for every word and every man, every woman of God that you place in our lives to teach us and bring the truth of your word to us. We are in a very uh, trying time at this time in our life. We know that things are beginning to mount up in this world. We can see, oh God, that, that things are beginning to change, oh God. And so God, let your people be aware and let us be alert and be on point, oh God. So Father, once again, we thank you for this night and and Father, I just thank you that you have allowed me to be here tonight to receive. I thank you for blessing me tonight, oh God. Yes. So Father, as we depart, God, we depart in your grace and your love. And we just once again just want to thank you and give you honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, sir. All right. All right so.